Good morning. Good morning. Happy, New Year. Happy New Year. First Sunday in 2024. It's amazing to be here and it's a wonderful thing. We have people on Zoom and YouTube, so we just rejoice that we are all gathered together to proclaim our risen Lord on this first Sunday of 2024. Uh, a couple of announcements uh, that I have before we see if any from the congregation. Uh, the first is our congregational meeting will be on February 18th. Uh, so it will be immediately after worship. It will be held here, and then we'll have a luncheon uh, in the uh, lobby afterwards, uh, as we've done in previous years. Uh, so we look forward to that uh, time together. We also, if you have, if you're a chair of a committee and you have books that need to be audited, please give them, uh, bring them into the uh, office and give them to Lisa, so that when we uh, begin auditing books, we'll have those available. So they'll be. Uh, we'll have the auditing team will be able to uh, make an announcement of what, how we've been doing at the annual meeting. Also, a week from tomorrow, we'll have, uh, we're having a, our first virtual prayer walk. And uh, it's in the bulletin. And so just really encourage everyone to look at that. I will be sending out a link for everyone to access uh, probably that morning. And then we will, at 7 o'clock, gather and really encourage you to come. For those of us who've gone on a prayer walk, and we've done Livingston and Boast and uh, the area over, uh, to, uh, area over here, the flat tops, and it's really been an enjoyable time, uh, really a, a refreshing time to gather and pray for people along the way, the community, the streets, and uh, members of our church who are uh, there. And we've extended this to... Uh, the rest of West, West Mifflin as well, and our prayer walk on a week from Monday will be focused on those communities that would be dangerous to walk in during the day, much less at night. So we, but we still want to pray for them. So it's going to be virtual. We'll all be gathered together on uh, by Zoom, and uh, Tom Richards, all the way from Utah, will be showing us. We'll be. Uh, virtually going through these communities and praying for them and just praying for our West Mifflin. So really encourage you to join us at uh, 7 p.m. on Monday, next Monday, a uh, week from uh, tomorrow. Uh, so those are my announcements. Do so we have annou announcements in the back? Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Fellowship wants to invite everyone uh, to join us next week as we have a snack and chat. And we're going to be featuring homemade soups and breads um, in honor of National Soup Month. So please plan to join us. Thank you. And we have one from Kate. Hi. See how pretty the sanctuary looks, how beautiful it is. Well, next week at this time, it won't look like that because we need to undecorate. And we will be doing that this coming Saturday morning, somewhere around 930. So, you know, many hands makes the work go a lot faster. So if you can make it, uh, we always have a good time doing it. <clears throat> we always have a good time doing it and um, it needs to be done. So if you can help us, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you much. Thank you, Kate. And while Kate's there, I just want to thank Kate for preaching last Sunday. She's waving me off and saying, no, no, so I want to talk a little more about that. Uh, but I really want to thank her for our preaching last Sunday. And, you know, I was able to watch it on YouTube, and it was really wonderful. And so uh, thank you, Kate. And again, anyone who would like to preach, let me know. Belinda, are you, you're up, right, soon? <laughs> so anyway... Anyway, so if anyone would like to preach, let me know. We're going to be uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, and certainly uh, no later than February, we're going to have a preaching class again so we can uh, talk about how to develop a sermon. So any other announcements? Not seeing any, then let us set ourselves on the worship of God.
Let us join together in our responsive call to worship. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Let us worship God. Sure. Let us go to God in unison and ask for his mercy and grace. God of newness and restoration, we celebrate the coming of the new year, not because of the festivities, but because we know that we have another opportunity to show you the depth of our love. Sadly, in the midst of our joy, we sin and fail to follow your word. Forgive us and bring us back to your path of righteousness so that we can once again know the gladness of being in a right relationship with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Christian friends, our sin is ever before us, and yet God is even more before us because he calls us back to himself despite anything we do, for he loves us and calls us his own. So hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Let's remain standing and affirm what we believe by sharing together in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. 
He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdoms shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray that God will open our hearts and minds. Lord of hope and joy, we give ourselves to you, heart, mind, body, and soul, to be infused with your holy word, made flesh in your Son, and inspired within Scripture. Enable us to hear, see, and understand the truth that will set us free, and then to share it with all those who have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts ready to receive. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our first reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58, and the book of Revelation, chapters, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, in the English Standard Version of the Bible. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must, must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. For when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of his prophecy, and blessed are those who hear, who keep what is written in it, for it, the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before him, his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth, to him who loves and has freed us from our sins in his blood, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God, and from, our sin, and from Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and, I, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail in account, on account of him. Even so, amen. And I am the Alpha and the Omega, says, the, says Lord God, who is who was and who is to come, the Almighty. May the Lord bless this reading and our understanding of his most holy word. 
So since we're going through the book of Genesis, I decided to pull, up, pull out an old classic of El Shaddai. Um, hopefully you do know this song. Uh, Michael Card wrote it, but it became famous by Amy Grant. Um, the first time we hear El Shaddai in the Bible is Genesis 17.1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be blameless. Um, it also shows up in Genesis 35.11. God says to Jacob, I am El Shaddai, be fruitful and multiply. Um, El Shaddai means God Almighty. El Eliana Adonai is God. God, God in the highest, O Lord. Er Kamkana Adonai is we will love you, O Lord. So hopefully um, you remember this one, and this is an older one, but I, I think it's a beautiful song. Die, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El 
don't know if I've ever told you this story. I'm sure Rich will tell me if I have. But um, I, I don't know Amy Grant, but when I was in Kenya, one of her best friends and one of the backup singers in her group uh, came to Kenya and we spent uh, some time together. And I remember this one evening where we just sang, the entire evening we sang Christian hymns. And uh, knowing she was Amy Grant's backup singer, I said, so uh, how did I do? And she said, you made a joyful noise to the Lord. <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, our scripture, for those of you who might not be aware of, I've sent out the entire chronological reading for the year. And for those who are still interested, we have chronological uh, Bibles in uh, the office. So afterwards, we've got the hardcover ones in. We've got a few of the paperback left. So if you would like one and like to participate, I really encourage you to see me immediately after worship. I'll make sure you get one. Uh, but we're going through scripture uh, day by day in the chronological form. And so each Sunday, I'll be preaching that day's uh, something from that day's reading. Today is day seven. And so it's uh, Genesis 23, verses 1 through 20. So here are these words from the book of Genesis. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kareth Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a so sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a, a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choices of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land, and he said to them, If you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me uh, Hebron, or Eph Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave in Machpelah, where, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered, Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in at the gate of his city. No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field, I, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bear your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, But if you will hear me, I give the price of the field. Accept it for me that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, my Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver, what is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area, was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, Sarah his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How do we think of death? In fact, is, some might say, is that really the best topic? The first Sunday of the new year, let's talk about death. You know, well... Death is a part of life, and it's really important as Christians how we un understand it and how we move forward from that concept. Death is never the final answer because the day is coming when we will be called to our real home along with all the saints that preceded us to stand in the presence, presence of the triune God and glorify God in Christ for all eternity. Now, that in many ways might sound like empty words. What does that mean? You know, because death is still a hard time for all of us. The death of a spouse, the death of a, a, a relative, the death of a son or a daughter, a child, the death of a puppy, a dog, a cat. You know, death does seem to have a finality to it that bothers many of us. 
Now, I don't know if you've seen this movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? But one of the songs in that, it just really struck me. Uh, because it, it's, uh, the guy is lamenting that he knows he's about to die, and he's seen death as this entity that can spare him. Oh death, oh death, won't you spare me over till another year? When we think about death, do we try to bargain with death? Do we try to think of it as this, this thing that we can uh, talk to, as, a, as opposed to a biological life and death type thing that we have to come to accept? Death can be very hard. Death is very hard. It's for, hard for all of us. If we care for someone, death can be, at times, overwhelming. In fact, many of you have heard of the five stages of grief by uh, these two uh, uh, psychologists called Kubla and Ross. Well, that's been, which were, are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And there's a cycle to that understanding. Well, guess what? Someone's expanded to it. Now there are seven stages of grief, adding shock and testing. But then we can go on any further, and then there are seven stages, but 12 steps. Of grief. So we can just keep on going. You know, I was looking for 22, 24. I was thinking, come on, I know there has to be more than just 12, but this is the highest one I got. So there's shock and denial all the way to acceptance and hope. And that even shows the cycle. It can go over and around and around and around until we come to a full understanding of the acceptance and hope that we are as Christians should have when it concerns our grief and death. One of the famous early poets in our country said, there is no grief like the grief that does not speak. Now, I was actually asked Nancy, because she's smarter than me, I said, what does that mean? And uh, she shared with me, she said, that's the grief that we have, but we can't articulate, we can't put into words. That until we put those, those words out there, our grief can hold us and can clutch us and can actually immobilize us. C.S. Lewis says, no one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. C.S. Lewis had a lot of pain in his life, but it wasn't until he married this woman named Joy that he really, and she suddenly died of cancer, or not suddenly, but she died of cancer after his caring for her so long, that the grief he felt at her passing, as he said, was like fear. What comes after? For her, for me, for us. Even following within the Kubler-Ross uh, uh, aspect of denial and anger, uh, shock, whatever, that, whatever those are, that acceptance can be hard to get to. Now, surprisingly, Abraham in our story, in chapter 23, verses 1 through 20, portrays this healthy aspect of grief. Abraham, I mean, this is a really good way of handling grief. Now, what do we know about Abraham? One, he's a keeper of God's promise. And two, he was one really messed up dude. I mean, if you want a case study on a messed up father, messed up family, messed up husband, all you have to do is read about Abraham. You know, he made a ton of wrong decisions. And not decisions that God had anything to do with. He just decided to do things on his own. One of the ones is, uh, one, when he goes into Egypt, there's a famine in the land, he goes to Egypt. He tells the Pharaoh that his wife is really his sister. And when, she, when he says, okay, I want to marry her, it's only until God intervenes that that stops. And the excuse he uses is, that I, I told you the truth, I thought you'd kill me if I told you the, tr if I told you the truth, but she really is my half-sister. Okay, but that doesn't really count for the next time he does it. He does the same thing. In Genesis 22, uh, 20, chapter 20, verse 2, Abraham said to his wife Sarah, she is my sister, so Ab uh, Abimelech, the king of Gerar, and had Sarah brought to him. And the thing is, he made a lot off of both incidents. I mean, he just made donkeys and cows and goats and servants. He just made a ton out of these two times that he was very deceptive. 
And I can, can only imagine what Sarah felt like. Yeah, yeah, I'm your sister, and you're just basically handing me over to other men. So like I said, Abraham is not the best example of a husband or a father. Yet, he, does, he is the father of faith. Because he does some things that speak to us and becomes, uh, God counted in him as righteousness. In Genesis 15, 6, And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. God says, you will, you will be more, your children will be more than the uh, sons of heaven or the, sons, uh, the stars in the sky. And Abraham believed, and God counted him as righteous because of that. It also follows in Romans 4.18 that against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as been told, so shall your offspring be. His faith in what God is saying and his obedience in what God is telling him to do those times when he was obedient, was counted to him as faith. And we see our own faith, and it shows us in Hebrews 11, is counted all the way back to Abraham as that father, the father of what we believe. As it says in Hebrews 11, by faith Abraham being called, obeyed to go out unto a place which he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he's going. Again, as we've done our reading so far, he's at 76, I think 76. He went from a place in present-day Iraq all the way down to the Middle East, all the way down to Israel, what is now Israel, Canaan, and he made his new home. Now we come to that last uh, different stage of life, another stage, where after 111 years of marriage, John, Janet, remember that, 111 years. You still got a few. After 111 years of marriage, Sarah dies. And as I said, his grief was he mourned her loss, mourned her passing. But the healthy part is he knew that he had to keep on going. And so his next role was to find a proper burial place for her. And so that is what we now know as uh, the cave at Machpelah near Mamre, which is present-day Hebron. And in Hebron today, there's a mosque built over that site. And there's part of the day Jews can come and worship, part of the day uh, Muslims can come and worship. They try not to mix those times together. But again, they recognize the, the, that area, who, the, the authorities over that mosque recognize that it is as vital to the Jews as it is to the Muslims, for they both look at Abraham and Sarah as the mother and father of faith. So let's look at our passage and see how this progresses. And what does it tell us about how death leads to life for us as Christians? So Genesis 23, 1-4 says, Sarah lived 127 years, and these were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kerith Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in, went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up, rose up from before his dead and, and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Now that's, you see the progression. He has come to accept the reality that his wife is dead. He's not dismissing his pain, he's not dismissing his mourning, but what he is, he's moving on to that next stage of ensuring that there's a proper place for her to be. We have to remember that Abraham was a nomad. He, he would settle here and he would settle there. He was in Philistine for a long time. Now he's among the Hittites in what is in present day Hebron. You know, he, he traveled and he did not own anything among the people, among the land. But here he wanted a permanent spot to bury his dead. Megan Devine, who is a, uh, a psychotherapist that focuses on grief, says, here's the truth about grief. Loss gets integrated, not overcome. However long it takes, your heart and your mind will carve out a new life amid the, this weirdly devastated landscape. Little by little, pain and love will find ways to coexist. There's a truth to that, that Abraham realizes that this is the, this, though it's the end of Sarah's life, it's not the end of his. 
And to honor her, he has to find a place for her to be. And a place that he can return to. And a place that he can return to when the days end and his life is over. And this place at the cave at Machpelah near memory becomes that place. Because life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. He realized that even in the midst of his mourning, he needs to progress and do other things. He can't give it to anyone else to do. He has to take that responsibility for himself because he is the head of the family. And he does that. And he begins this process of talking with the Hittites about this particular piece of land. So it continues in Genesis 23, the Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choices of, your to- uh, choices of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the Lord, uh, land, and he said to them, If you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is the end of his field, for the full price will I have given to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Abraham begins this process of conversation. I don't say negotiation, even though it may seem like that. This is a process of conversation to gain permanence. It's interesting that the Hittites are saying, choose our choices tombs. Basically, take Sarah and put her in a tomb that's already occupied. Because tombs back then weren't just a one-person deal. Tombs were family, family groups. An entire family, entire series of people in that family. The descendants would all be in one place. And so the Hittites are saying, sure. Any one of us, the fanciest tomb we've got, you can put Sarah in there. But Abraham wasn't really keen on that idea. You always have to be skeptical of freebies, don't you? Isn't that that neat, freebies? You know, you got to be skeptical of, you know, things that people offer you for free. Here they were saying, sure, we don't want to give, I mean, we're not giving you something new. We're giving you something used. We're giving you something that there's going to be other folks, you know, buried there. And burying back then is, again, the process is you were laid in a tomb uh, until your flesh was no more, then your bones were gathered, and they were put in a box. And that box was put on a shelf. And then, so you'd go into any tombs, and depending on the process of how many people have died, you would have boxes and then you would have bodies. So that's what they were saying, we'll do. We'll give, you a, we'll give you a place, and at the end of the time, put it in a box, put it on the shelf, good to go. And you can come to our tomb and worship, or our tomb and you know, uh, pay homage to your wife in our tomb. And that was a freebie that was being offered to Abraham that he was not willing to accept. Have you ever heard of the, the concept of permanence of objects? You know, children, babies, you play that peekaboo game, you know, peekaboo. You know, at a certain age, when they're months old, when you cover your face with your hands, they actually think you've disappeared. I mean, that, they just said, where did, they, where did mom and dad go? Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, they were here just a second ago. And then you open up your hands, they go peekaboo, and they go, oh, you know, oh, there they are. Children have that idea to, uh, children or little babies can, can lose that, have that sense of, uh, develop a sense of permanence. Where you close this, oh, mom and dad are still there, there's just hands are covering their face. What Abraham wanted is he wanted a sense of permanence. He wanted a place not just for Sarah, not just for himself, but for his entire lineage that God had promised him. Now at this point, he has one kid. He has Isaac. And Isaac's a grown man, but that's all he has. So what is his real needs at that point? But he's not looking at the immediate need. He's looking at the long-term need. So he begins, again, continues his conversation now with Ephraim himself. Now Ephraim was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephraim the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites. 
of all who went in at the gate of the city. That, that's another thing. The men of the town, it's like that old, being in that old general store, and they'd sit around the popular stove. I mean, that's an old concept. Well, back here, the concept, they would sit at the city gates. The elders of the city would sit at the city gates, and that's where they'd make their decisions. And so there are, he's gathered, Hebron, Abraham, all the elders are gathered at the city gates of uh, Hebron, or uh, the city they're in. And it says, No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron, In the hearing of the people of the land, But if you will, hear me. I give, I give the price of the field, accept it for me that I might bury my dead there. Here now you have Ephron offering the field, offering the cave, saying, sure, you can have it all, and seemingly again, for free. Milton Freeman said there's no such thing as a free lunch. Again, without a signed contract, and believe it or not, we have signed contracts from that time today of showing property transfer. So, but if, the, if you did not have a signed transfer of property, who owns the property? So yeah, you might put Sarah there first time, but you know, cousin Ida might go there the week after, and Uncle Cletus the day after that. We don't know, but that property is still mine, and, and Abraham is recognizing that's not what I'm looking for. I'm not looking to put my wife into a tomb that already has people. I'm not looking to put my wife in a place that I don't own. He's looking for that permanence. And again, I've said it clearly, this is not a negotiation. Even though Ephron might be thinking it is, this is a conversation. Because we, we see in the next passage of Scripture what happens. Ephron answered Abraham, my Lord, listen to me, a piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Ephron, uh, Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. Now, I don't know about you, but I have to think, what is 400 shekels of silver worth? Because you see what Abraham did? He paid full price. He didn't negotiate. He said, what, what do you want? 400 shekels. What's 400 shekels? Here. Here's what. You, know, you wanted 400 shekels. You named it. Here. Full price. This ensures a couple of things. It ensures that, one, this is now fully his property, and two, that no one can accuse him of cheating or negotiating in bad faith because the number named by Ephron the Hittite was the, not, was the amount he gave. Now, some might wonder, was this piece of property worth 400, sh sh you know, 400 uh, shekels of silver? Well, in today's world, that would be worth about $3,500. And I don't know what sort of property you can get for $3,500, but that's because silver is more common today than it was back then. Back then... It was worth uh, $624,000. So that's what Abraham pulled out of his pocket. Here, $624,000. And I don't know much property that would be worth that amount of money for a cave and a field. So I think if you were thinking, if, did Ephron get a good deal? Ephron got a great deal. And that's why Abraham wasn't going to negotiate. He was going to say, whatever you say, so the field of Ephron and Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field of the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field throughout this whole area, was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his, of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, and, is, and in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. And this is a property that still exists and that still is, by all purposes, belonging to Abraham and his descendants. And this becomes the first part of Canaan that is, without a doubt, inherited by the people of Israel. And for them, it's a done deal. 
Now, they're given the rest of the land of Canaan by the promise that is given to them to Abraham, the, the land that he was going to possess, the land flowing with milk and honey. But this piece of property, the final piece of property that everyone would end up, or actually the temporary stopgap until it would be for all the people. Because in truth, this is just a rest area. You know, when we think of, again, death, do we think of it as a finality, a final destination? This is it. So I think even when Christians, we do have that tendency. We think this is all there is. Now, non-Christians, they have nothing for them that says it would be any different. You die, you're done. What, what's in the grave is what will stay there. But for Christians, that has never been the case. Jesus made it clear that there's something very different when it comes to what we understand Christianity to be. You know, every symbol, word, concept, discipline, and field is only a temporary rest stop on the highway of discovery. And for Christians, the more we come to understand what God tells us through his word in Jesus Christ and his word in Scripture, yet here's another plug to do this chronological year through the Bible enables us to understand more and more what he wants us to do and what he's calling us to do and the hope that ends everything. Because the hope is not in the hope is not that we can live good lives through Jesus Christ. The hope is that Christ is coming again because he is the firstborn of the dead. He is the first fruits of the resurrection. He is the one that is coming to return for all of us who believe. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us this, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the point of we, what we need to understand, is that we have new life when we die. That there might be a time, a time lag between the time we die until the time we are lifted up in new creation, but that doesn't matter because that is the reality of the new life we have. And when we are baptized, when we take communion, when we participate in worship, we are proclaiming to each other and to the world, this is the new life we have taken hold of. This is the hope that we have grasped onto. But we got to wait for it. Because, tick-tock, it's been 2,000 years. Hasn't it? Jesus died about 2,000 years ago. He said he was coming soon. Now we see in Acts 1, 6-7, he said to them, Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has said by his own authority. It says in Matthew, no one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So we know God in heaven, he knows when he's sending his son back. We don't. And the early Christians thought it would be any time. They thought it was going to be today. They thought it would be tomorrow. If it's not today, it's tomorrow. If it's not tomorrow, it's next week. If it's not next week, it's going to be this year. And Christians have been saying that for going on 2,000 years. But that's all right, because what do the angels, what do these two men in white say to the disciples when they're standing gawking up in heaven because Jesus has risen in a cloud? They say, don't stand there. Go and do what he told you to do. Go and prepare yourself to receive the Holy Spirit, and then when you've received the Holy Spirit, to go out into the world proclaiming the truth that Jesus Christ has risen. That is what he told them, to, that is what these angels told them to do. That is why we are called to be the good news in our community. We are to show our community that we are Christians, that we love them, and we hold them as precious, and that we want to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Because that day is coming when the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That day is coming. And it is our job in pre preparation for that day to share that news with the world so that they can understand who he is. Because he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be. Amen. No one's going to mistake the coming of Christ again. No one's going to be confused. What's this? Did he come? 
Oh, let's go and see this kid in a manger because some angels told us. Or let's go and see this kid because a star led us. Or, yeah, I, I, I've heard about this. I've seen this. Someone told me about this. No, every eye will see this reality. And this is the joy of our living hope. This is the joy of our living hope. That Christ is coming. That death is not the final answer. That what Abraham did in the cave at Machpelah near Mamre was not to say this is a memorial where we can just go and pay homage to those who have died before us. This is a rest area for all who have died until Christ returns. And then we will all, those who believe, will ascend together and be with God for all eternity. And therefore, our response to that is, come Lord Jesus. And he's coming soon. I'm not saying it's today. I'm not saying it's tomorrow. I'm not saying it's this week, this month, this year. But he's coming soon. And we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. And until then, we need to not sit on our hands, but proclaim the truth to the world that Jesus Christ is Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And Christian friends, when we gather to this table, this is what we proclaim and this is what we rejoice in. We say to everyone that have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts ready to receive, that Jesus Christ is our Lord, and Jesus Christ is your Lord, so that they can, too, come to understand who Christ is in their lives. We invite all who believe this to be the spiritual presence of Jesus Christ to partake of this. We invite those who are on Zoom and later on YouTube that to, to have the juice and the uh, the bread uh, elements ready and to take as instructed. For us here today, uh, after uh, our prayer and the words of institution, we invite people to come forward into the middle of the aisle, come and take one cup per person and return by the side aisles and then again, take the elements as instructed. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much for your son. We thank you so much that death is not the final answer. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Your sting and your victory has been tossed aside by the resurrection of your son. And through that, by the promise of our own resurrection, when your son comes again. Until that day, Lord, let us be united as we believe in the truth of Jesus Christ. And let us enjoy with, let us be overcome with joy at the sharing together of this wonderful meal. We ask all this in your son's holy name. Amen. Christian friends were told on the night our Lord and Savior was betrayed. After uh, giving thanks, he took a loaf of bread and broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and says, This cup is a new covenant in my blood for the remission of sins. For as often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christian friends, the feast is before us. Let's partake of this wonderful meal.
Christian friends, this is the body of Christ. Take a knee. Christian friends, this is the blood of Christ. Take and drink. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you on this first Sunday of the new year. We rejoice that you love us and we rejoice that we know your promise will be kept. That a day will come when the trumpet will sound and your son will descend on the cloud to claim all that believe. We look forward to that day, Lord. Until that day comes, let us seek your face in so many ways through our actions, our our beliefs, our efforts at righteousness, knowing that though we might not be righteous, you love us despite that. We ask your blessings on our church in this uh, this coming new year. Let it be faithful and spirit-filled. Be with all those who are still traveling because of the holidays or for other reasons. Lord, we ask you to be with Bill Braun, who uh, was a member of our church and uh, is getting on in years. He's not doing well. Just be with him during this time uh, of COVID and flu and pneumonia. Just uh, lay your hand a blessing upon him. Be with Cindy Hawk's brother, Tom, as he's recovering from back surgery. Be with Belinda's friend, Mike, who needs a kidney transplant. And uh, the person she brought to our attention, Brooks, and the family that Brooks, a little five-year-old, has rare cancer. We pray for a complete recovery and healing. Lord, be with Peggy Pryle, who has eye issues, and be with her uh, brother Tom, who has heart issues and uh, recently became a Christian. Be with Brian Hawk, Bob Hawk's son, and their uh, children, and his children, as they go through a difficult family dynamic time. Be with Cindy, Bob's wife, who has some Uh, general health issues, no definite diagnosis, but be with her. Be with Leslie Holloman, who has COVID, is recovering. Be with her brother, Dale, who's in hospice and is not doing well. With her sister, Lisa, who's overcoming cancer, and her father, Bill. Lord, we ask your blessing on Donna Carney, who has an upcoming PET scan and knee surgery. Be with Adeline uh, Jamello, who on December 26th had her tonsils and adenoids removed and who's gone through some difficult times since then. Lord, be with Nathan Wheeler, uh, who has this medication uh, illness diagnosis. Be with her. Be with uh, Justina's son, Gianna, uh, who is in Children's Hospital with this high fever and coughing home now. Be with Nina Garden and her her son, Noah, who's mourning the soon loss of their dog, Uh, who is soon to pass away, with all those who have lost uh, beloved pets. Be with them. Give them your strength. Lord, be with all the victims and their families in the shooting in Iowa. That seems to be such a common thing that happens nowadays. Give those families your strength. Give the victims your strength. Be with the Petruzzi family, Lord. Be with Nancy and John and their daughter, Kim. Be with John Weber, who is blood clots in his lung are slowly being absorbed with Terry Nicholson as she continues to mourn the passing of her dad and as she and her brother Mark support uh, their mom, Carol, through her grief. Lord, be with uh, Robert uh, Montgomery, uh, Pearl Montgomery's uh, brother-in-law, who was here on Christmas Eve. We rejoice in that. Uh, Be with him. Let him continue to overcome his heart issues and his leukemia. Be with Dick Snyder, who has kidney issues. Uh, be, and who is struggling with his health. Be with uh, Belle as she supports him and loves him. Lord, be with uh, Pam Mervis's friend, Jordan, who uh, is continuing chemo, just a few more tre- treatments before she starts the radiation. Be with Alice Tashwar's granddaughter, Adeline, and her grandson, Antonio, who are, both are struggling with health issues. With Pat and Roger Nickel, with Bernie Hollis, 
with Bob Scheider and Rocky Macero. Give them your strength. The Lord, we ask your continued blessings to be with Tony, who's recovering and will soon to, uh, teach again, and Belinda, who uh, will retire again. Be with Michael Beck, who has ongoing life struggles. Be with Bob Hawk's friend Larry, who is uh, struggling with leukemia. His friend John Kupchella, who's recovering from a kidney transplant. Another friend, Carrie McCain, who's recovering from a hip, a hip replacement. Be with Debbie and Jim Ebers, uh, a family member Jan, uh, Debbie's sister, who is struggling with leukemia. Be with the Wonka family, with their friend Big Don, who has renal failure, needs a transplant. Mike, who has heart issues, Buff. Uh, Cardwell family, who has family dynamics, and April Wonka and her two sons and their father, who also with family dynamics. Lord, be with Tommy and Debbie Beckevac. Debbie has COVID again, but is recovering. Tommy is just steadfast with her at all times. We thank you for that. Be with Sherry Strawn's friend, uh, Marcy. Be with Amy Hines as she has ongoing health issues. And Lord, be with the Benders. Be with uh, their niece, Amy, and their friend, Lillian. Be with the Richards as they enjoy their time in Utah. And Lord, be with all of us as we seek uh, to help each other through our depressions, our anxieties, uh, confrontations with difficult life decisions, our private hurt and pain. Let us know that we always have you as our hope and our assurance. Lord, be with our nation. Let it not be so politically divided. Protect our police and our military. And give us peace and security. And Lord, be with, our, be with the world. In all those different places are the hot spots. Open hearts to do your will. Open hearts to see your truth. Open hearts to forgive each other and to love each other. Lord, we ask your blessings on all of us as we seek to do your will each and every day. And as we pray the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christian friends, we have offering baskets in the back. For those who have already given your offering, we thank you for that. As you leave, if you'd like to, that'd be great. And those on YouTube and Facebook, if you'd like to send your offerings in, again, that'd be wonderful as we seek as a community of faith to spread the good news of Jesus Christ out into West Mifflin and out, out to the world. Let's pray. Dear Lord, bless these gifts and let them be used for your purpose. Bless these gifts that be, lose, uh, be used for your truth. And bless each one of us as we give uh, joyfully and faithfully according to your calling. We thank you and love you in your son's holy name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here.
Christian friends, as we leave this place today, let us leave knowing the hope and the assurance we have from God that he will send his son. Until that day, until that wonderful and glorious day, let us live our lives, each and every one of them, proclaiming Jesus Christ to all that have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to receive. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the companionship of God's Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of us now and always. Amen. God of the ages, history's maker, planning our pathway, holding us fast, shaping in mercy all that concerns us. Father, we pray. Good, good. Josh is on a six-week...